I'll just say quickly, because there's this perception that opposition to euthanasia comes from um, religiously motivated social conservatives and because it's quite visible that I'm Muslim and I have written quite a lot about Muslim-related issues, I say, yes, I'm Muslim, but that's not where I'm coming from on this particular issue. And just as a rough indicator, I think that it is absolutely appropriate for Parliament to pass to legislation allowing same-sex marriage, for example. My religious identity doesn't govern who I have sex with or how often or anything like that. It certainly wouldn't stop me from on this. Sorry. I'll just put this in. So I haven't had such a lifelong experience of disability as the previous speakers. Um, and that shows, I think, in some regards. Actually, it turned out that I had been living with undiagnosed remitting, relapsing, and mostly you know, in its initial years in remission, multiple sclerosis, basically all of my adult life. But I didn't know that at the time. And, um, and yes, yeah, so I would have said at one point that if I'd been told that I would be not physically able to go off to Pakistan during times of political crisis and interview feminists and activists and Taliban supporters, you know, and go, you know, um, into dodgy areas that DFAT says nobody should go. I would have said that that would mean my life was not worth living. I would have said that not being able to engage in that level of um, activism and to go and um, speak to people who were being impacted on by the wars that we engage in, I would have said, oh, well, my life's not worth living because I can't contribute, or not can't contribute, I can't fight those battles in the way that I want to fight them. And everything that I've worked for so hard, it's just been a waste. But that turns out not to be the case, even though I still do go off to Pakistan when my health allows. You know, I haven't given up on that. It turns out, actually, you know, I can still live a worthwhile life without getting onto the plane last week when the Pakistani government fell, that was kind of a bummer. I would like to be in Lahore right now, interviewing the former prime minister, who I, whose family I interviewed when he was kicked out of government last time. That's just to say, that's partly a big preamble because when you hear people talking and saying, I have been independent all my life, and if that independence is taken away, well, I might as well be dead. There's this implication, you have independence, you know, actually what? Do you agree with that? You know. I've, I, you know, it, that's, a, that's a weird measure of independence which I used to subscribe to times 10, you know. And yet, it's, it, I was mistaken and you are mistaken too in thinking that that's the way we should be gauging this. Is, is there a penalty when the bill goes off? It's okay, it's still, we're fine. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, yep, yep. Um, yeah. So, and... But I will say you inched about assisted dying. I think the language around this is important. It sounds kind of like much more acceptable, but you are talking about killing people. At the very least, you're talking about suicide. And most of us, by the time we get to middle age, I am deeply middle-aged, we know people, we've had probably family members who have at some point said, that they wanted their doctors to kill them because they were, you know, in bad health. Most of us, or many, well, I can't say most of us, many of us would also know people who had committed suicide. I'm not seeing a huge difference around the type of language around those what are conventionally understood as suicides and tragic and we should have tried to stop them and if only. And the kind of language around this kind of death and this kind of suicide about value, and also the types of rationalization too, when all these testimonies from people who have taken their lives because of terminal illness and why it was the best thing. But that is the type of rationalization that people make after any suicide. Oh, it was so sad. You know, at least she's at peace now. At least it's over. At least it's done. You know, it's how people get up and keep going. Multiple sclerosis is not a terminal illness, although it 
I think 10% of what your life expectancy might otherwise have been. And I would assume that a lot of the treatments that I've had, which are to suppress my immune system by the warnings, that, you know, likely they will have an impact on my life expectancy as well. But, you know, those are the odds. And that's, well, I'm not going to say that's all right. But um, those are decisions that we make every time we take a Panadol, you know, that we'll have, you know, we won't have a headache right now and we'll take the odds. But like, I'll just add, this connects also with my other, my major research, which is around issues to do with race and issues to do with gender. And this comes back to what we're saying about some lives being seen as worth more than others. And like, I will note that the level of, I haven't been able to find if there's been any research done in Australia measuring support for euthanasia in different communities. But there has been in the United States, and there's significantly lower levels of support among African Americans um, than among the mainstream community. And there's speculation, well, that's because there's higher levels of religiosity in that community. Maybe. But that's also because black lives are, are already valued less, and because African Americans have reason not to trust the system and not to trust the state. This has always been put in terms of individual rights, but it's not. It's putting more power in the hands of the state and it's putting more power in the hands of medical professionals. It's not really about um, empowering individuals. And I think the same would be true of Australia. I think, you know, reading between the lines, that part of the reason that my diagnosis was delayed um, well, certainly one of the neurologists who initially told me that my inability to walk was psychiatric said explicitly, oh, well, it's a psychiatric issue and it's very common in women like you. Well, just as fucking well that I'd been studying race and gender for so long because phrases like women like you set off every single alarm bell and I asked for a second opinion. But, you know, <laughs> but yeah, there, like, that, that, that particular types of people are just seen as being you know, troublesome and difficult in various ways. I know some Aboriginal friends, well, you would have seen the coverage of that very famous and prominent musician, you know, Dr. Inipingu, who we lost last week, who didn't have access to dialysis as he should have. And I have other Aboriginal friends too, who are having difficulty in getting, well, in having family members tested for compatibility for kidney donations and whatever because of their medical professionals' perceptions that they live in remote communities, that they won't likely... At, or, you know, again, you have to read between the lines, but it seems to them that... Um, that... Yeah, OK. All right.